All right, it is a pleasure to introduce our first session. The group of scholars in this panel are well respected and well known and they really don't need much of an introduction and we're running low on time anyway so you're not going to get one. So, but anyway, their names not only appear on their own publications, but if you pick up any book about Buffalo Bill and many books about the history of the American West and go to the acknowledgments, more than likely you'll run across these three names, Paul Fees, Steve Friesen, and Peter Hasrick. Paul Fees is the former curator of the Buffalo Bill Museum, and he is a resident scholar. We're fortunate he still lives here in Cody because he's our go-to guy when we have a question about Buffalo Bill. Uh, Steve Friesen is the curator of the Buffalo Bill Museum at Lookout Mountain, sometimes referred to as the opposition here. <laughs> but uh, despite our disagreements over Buffalo Bill's final wishes as to where he wanted to be buried, we get along very well and we collaborate with one another. In fact, I told Steve we, we noticed in his slide presentation a few mistakes that we corrected for him and added some additional information. <laughs> and then uh, Peter Hasrick, former curator of the Whitney Museum of Western Art and director of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And uh, quite a few years ago I took one of Peter's classes from the Larum Institute and learned all about art which has really helped me paint my living room. I appreciate that, <laughs> Peter. So these scholars today will consider the questions of how we have interpreted Buffalo Bill's life and legacy in the past, as well as touching upon his historical legacy and how it stands today. So what we will do is we'll bring up our first speaker, Paul Fees. He has 20 minutes. Each speaker has 20 minutes. When 20 minutes hits, Thanks to their spouses, wonderful, embarrassing slides will pop up of them. So uh, wait, wait, 20 minutes, and then after all presentations, we will open it for questions from the audience. Uh, we do have a wireless mic that we will pass around, so if you have a question, please, please wait for the mic to get to you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul Fees. Thank you, Jeremy. I've already noticed that Steve's presentation is too long, and uh, <laughs> you're going to have to cut it short because I'm taking that extra time. I've put this on paper to give the illusion of organization, but uh, it's just an illusion. Um, I'm going to close this. Security has it gotten a little shorter out there, Paul. <laughs> I can't read by computer light either. Can I put this somewhere else? Uh, you can fold that down. And this won't go away? Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's interesting that uh, one of the introductory statements was about uh, asking people what they think of, uh, when they hear Wild West Show. Uh, this museum sponsored in, or participated in an exhibition a long time ago, which I'll mention in this talk. Uh, and people on the streets of New York were interviewed, asking them, who's Buffalo Bill? And uh, the variety of responses was pretty wonderful. There is a videotape of this still in, our, uh, in the museum's archives. Um, they all knew he had something to do with the West, but I think that's because of the buffalo in front of the bill. I don't think that we're going to find, if we ask nationally uh, about Wild West shows, that people are really going to be as aware of Buffalo Bill's Wild West as we in this room are. Um, in a way, we are going to be self-referential here, in fact. And worse than that, I'm going to be talking about the museum. Uh, all of which, all of, all of you will have had a chance, of course, to walk through this place. Uh, although it won't be about this museum exclusively because there are other targets out there. Uh, in the 1980s, though, this was a real moment of awareness for me and for my wife, too. Um, Peter Hastrick was asked in an interview, he's a, he was our director, Peter was asked in an interview uh, when the uh, caldera is getting ready to blow, what are you going to grab from the Buffalo Bill Historical Center? 
and uh, Nancy and I had already decided that we were going to see if we couldn't wrestle out Coming Through the Rye by Frederick Remington. And I assumed Peters would be something like that. No, he said, Buffalo Bill's Saddle. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's to me, an indication of how important Buffalo Bill must have been because Peter didn't come here as a Buffalo Bill guy, I don't think. And maybe that's an anecdote for that panel later today. Uh, but the importance of Buffalo Bill, including the attempts at name changes in this place, uh, there was a time when the board wanted to change the name to uh, the, uh, the Western Heritage Center, something like that, but leaving out Buffalo Bill's name. But it still has Buffalo Bill's name in front, uh, despite that change to Center of the West. What he means to this institution is pretty clear. Or is it? Um, since William Frederick Cody died a century, a uh, hundred and a half years ago, scholars and critics have tried intermittently to come to terms with his meaning or his meanings. Um, and this place is part of that struggle. In his own time, Buffalo Bill, better than anybody, of course, symbolized that story, the winning of the West. Uh, that is, he embodied and in his Wild West show, he simplified and conveyed a particular narrative of American history, the myth of the West, as we called it. And it was a myth that helped to unify uh, a divided nation after the Civil War and that uh, helped that it celebrated individual heroic values um, and particularly celebrated this myth, a collective national accomplishment. It was broad, it was inclusive, um, it was progressive, and in fact, uh, it fit very nicely with the idea of progress. Another sort of driving myth, uh, particularly for Americans, but also for most of Western civilization. However, um, that myth itself and the narrative, and certainly the winning of the West part of the narrative became over the years as ambivalent as the various understandings of Buffalo Bill himself. And the understanding of Buffalo Bill, uh, by scholars particularly, um, jibed in a way with, um, with our national perception of the role of the West in American history. Now the nadir of Buffalo Bill's reputation in the academy, uh, and that's not Ralph Nader, although they may be related, uh, came with the publication of Henry Nash Smith's Virgin Land, um, which was published in 1950 and was adopted really as, as the primary scripture of American studies through the 1970s. Um, Smith was the uh, founder, in a sense, of what was called the Myth and Symbol School of American Studies. That's the, uh, that's the school of approach to American culture, in fact, that I was steeped in in graduate school. But his take on Buffalo Bill was founded on the dime novel, which was one of his sources of cultural understanding of American mores, uh, and on a 1928 debunking uh, biography of Buffalo Bill by a guy named Richard Walsh, who wrote it in collaboration with Milton Salisbury, who himself was steeped in uh, sort of a myth of Buffalo Bill by his uh, by Nate Salisbury, who by the end of his life was uh, regretting that he hadn't put his name first on the posters. Um, Smith said it was an accident plus a natural gift for dramatizing himself that made Buffalo Bill such a center of attention. The accident he's referring to is his discovery by Ned Buttline. And uh, the story that he understood from Walsh's biography and from other sources was that Luther North slander that said when Ned Buttline came looking for Frank North or Wild Bill Hickok, um, North said, no, what you want is, and pointed to the form of Buffalo Bill lying probably drunk under a wagon. Um, later, during one of those boomlets in Buffalo Bill's fame, uh, which I'll explain, um, in 1989, uh, and coincidentally, that's the same year that Patricia Limerick, who may be here somewhere, uh, came out with her uh, Not a Manifesto, which is a collector's item for those of you who kept it. Um, an historian was quoted in the Wall Street Journal, 
uh, an historian whom I won't name unless you ask me later. And where he got this, I don't understand quite, but he said, we're learning that Buffalo Bill was a very average person who, by his own promotion, transformed himself into an international figure of mythic proportions. Uh, but my, uh, my favorite uh, quotation from that, that spate of things that were being said in the press then in 1989 was from the New Haven Register, which printed that Buffalo Bill represented, quote, a fraudulent mythologizing of greed and corruption. <laughs> well, the myth of the West was under attack in many places. Uh, the Smithsonian was about to come out with its uh, exhibition, The West as America. It was the end of the Reagan presidency and the beginning of um, the first Bush, of course, and uh, uh, cowboy diplomacy was coming uh, into uh, people's focus as perhaps something else that some other, there must be some other way to approach the world. Uh, and the idea of progress itself was in question and there were people writing about the death of progress. I'm gonna go into that for just a second because it does, despite the way this is gonna sound, have some relevance for the history of Buffalo Bill in the museum. Um, the United States, of course, was born in the 18th century Enlightenment. Uh, uh, Enlightenment was an article of faith, and the American Revolution and the subsequent um, pressing of Americans into, of American civilization itself into the wilderness uh, during the early national period um, it began to make even otherwise pessimistic observers, uh, like New England divines, optimistic that enlightenment could be a democratic process. So the myth, uh, or uh, of the win uh, the myth of the West, or of the winning of the West, took root before the Civil War, and it blossomed afterward, uh, as it became truly a powerful unifying force. Um, and uh, in the face of political and economic, have I talked that long already, Sam? You're really in trouble, Steve. Um, anyway, uh, scholars questioning the uh, idea of progress have said things like Leslie Fiedler said famously that um, the pilgrims who came here found only disillusionment and left only disillusionment for the rest of us to find. Still, um, we seem to have in our grasp at one time this uh, idea that we could produce a great society. And certainly the myth of the West had a lot to do with powering that. Um, among Western historians at least, it was the new Western historians who first saw that uh, perhaps that myth as it had been articulated had begun to play out. Um, I think they look back on our Western past not as a lost golden age exactly, but as uh, perhaps a lost age of, uh, of golden opportunity. Um, well, what does this have to do with museums? All right, first, Mary Jester Allen, the founder of this place, was a niece of Buffalo Bill and um, uh, an agent, for a publicity agent, who worked for John Burke in the Wild West show in the 1890s. Uh, she had a small collection herself of stuff related to her uncle and of particularly of publicity materials from the show. She claimed at one time that uh, her uncle had told her when he was, when they were visiting family in Seattle, that he wanted his memorial to be a museum of Western history. So she established the Buffalo Bill Museum with local help in 1927. Um, and incidentally, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, it's connected with the Baseball Hall of Fame in that uh, the groundbreaking team for the Buffalo Bill Museum in 1926, Trish Speaker Ty Cobb. Couldn't be better. <laughs> Buffalo Bill himself spaded the first spade of dirt for the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. I just made that up. <laughs> um, what she succeeded as, uh, let me say this about Mary Destrallen first. She wasn't so narrowly focused on Buffalo Bill himself that she was creating some sort of little narrow museum. No, she had an idea that, that this could become a pioneer center, a Buffalo Bill historical center in a sense with uh, 
devoted to Plains Indians, devoted to transportation, perhaps firearms, certainly art. What she succeeded as founding in founding is a stronghold against Richard White and the debunkers and any sort of future deterioration of the understanding of the American West as the uh, center of American progress was a reliquary. And in fact, the, uh, the committee of women who were charged with obtaining materials for the museum was called the Relics Committee. And that was certainly true until she was retired by the board in 1959. This building was built in 1969. Uh, now, like many other Western historians, uh, I came of age in the wake of uh, Fess Parker's Davy Crockett, uh, that phenomenon. I had a clean skin cat. Uh, I really believed in Crockett's motto, be sure you are right and then go ahead. And my first introduction to Buffalo Bill probably, as well as I can remember, was in the late 1950s um, at Lookout Mountain, the gravesite. Now the museum there at the time was actually older than this museum. It had been founded by Johnny Baker in 1921, I believe. And, uh, and yet, um, the museum itself seemed indistinguishable from its gift shop. How far it has come under the direction of Steve and his predecessor, uh, right up until the late 80s, it continued to be, uh, to be more um, gift shop than, uh, than museum. Now, both museums were reliquaries. They were anecdotal. They didn't seem to tell a story, but that doesn't mean there was no narrative, and it certainly doesn't mean that there was no interpretation. But rather, like the uh, Buffalo Bill Museum here, there was an implicit narrative, and that narrative was conveyed in Buffalo Bill's Wild West, the winning of the West, uh, the heroism, uh, the adulation of Buffalo Bill. I want to mention here that maybe you don't know, but that there's a third Buffalo Bill Museum. Uh, it's in LeClaire, Iowa. and. Uh, it actually is mostly focused on river boating, but it does have a little corner of mostly secondary materials related to Buffalo Bill. Well, I came here in 1981, um, and it was the same at that time. It was a reliquary. Um, we like to say, as I said, that there was no interpretation, but really there was. It was an assumption that visitors already knew Buffalo Bill that uh, there was an implicit narrative, in fact, of the winning of the West. And what we mean by no interpretation is that it was uncritical of that narrative. By 1986, this museum had been reinstalled with context, with explanations of what history and myth mean. Uh, it brought into uh, focus Indians and conflict. Uh, it introduced the concept of race. But those changes were driven by traveling exhibitions. So it wasn't just in this museum. And the first traveling exhibition that brought Buffalo Bill into national focus was actually driven by art and a new appreciation of Western art. Um, Peter Hasrick, in, uh, in concert with uh, his counterparts at the Brooklyn Museum in New York and the Carnegie Museum in, P Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, put together an exhibition called Buffalo Bill and the Wild West. Um, its curator was David Katzev from the Brooklyn Museum, but his personal focus was on Buffalo Bill as America's first media hero. However, they did put together a superb book of essays, which is still a superb book of essays, um, with uh, contributors including Peter, of course, but also uh, Ryan Deloria, who re-examined Buffalo Bill in light of his relationship with Indians, Howard Lamar, Leslie Fiedler, whom I've already quoted, uh, Richard Slotkin, in other words, it took Buffalo Bill seriously. And then another exhibition from the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, again, art-driven, Frontier America, opened in New York in 1988. Um, and it provided a narrative context, began to look critically at that myth. Um, Buffalo Bill was shown as part of a process. By the way, that was a great year for Buffalo Bill. Here in Cody, we uh, had a dedication ceremony for the Postal Service's introduction of the 15-cent Buffalo Bill stamp where he's shown wearing a business suit, by the way. So taking seriously Buffalo Bill in temporary exhibitions, um, the New Le Newberry Library curator, Jim Grossman, um, teaming up with Richard White, uh, came to uh, terms, Richard did, with the F word, 
uh, in an exhibition called The Frontier in American Culture, which opened in Chicago in 1994. And it was focusing on that wonderful confluence, uh, the historical coincidence of Buffalo Bill and Frederick Jackson Turner being in Chicago at the same time, not meeting, but giving similar messages. Um, Richard wrote in his essay, we need to take Buffalo Bill as seriously as Frederick Jackson Turner. It was an excellent book that came out of that, a book that had a contribution not only from Richard, but an essay from Patricia Limerick, who is here. And in her essay, by the way, Bill Kittredge of Montana had already made this observation that many people were living in a museum culture, but Patty said that one measure of the true end of the real frontier was what she called the museumization in Western life. Now, by which, of course, is meant uh, that it had become, the West had become a sort of a theme park, a, a fantasy land of authentic constructed frontier, uh, frozen in time, you know, a museum. And um, yet, it also took Buffalo Bill seriously. And there were other exhibitions I've mentioned, West is Frontier. Um, I mean, the uh, myth of the West and, uh, and the West as America. Uh, the myth of the West was one that showed Elvis, my favorite image, Elvis as a cowboy. Um, the Royal Armories Museum closed out the 20th century and introduced the 21st with an exhibition called Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which attempted to lay to rest misconceptions about the man and to show his influence um, on, on uh, Europe and to demonstrate the respectful treatment in the Wild West show of, the, of Indian people. What I'm saying is that museums are not static. Sometimes they're cutting edge, not often. Uh, but they are best at synthesizing uh, the latest knowledge and interpretations of history for a wider public, sometimes to a fault. Uh, this museum underwent a reinstallation a few years ago, and uh, Jeremy and the staff here are working to overcome a shortcoming in interpretation that uh, became obvious after a while. Um, in a way, this museum reverted to the way it had been before 1986, from Mary Jester Allen's time until that reinstallation. It was a reversion to the anecdotal um, uh, with a twist. That is, uh, it assumes as of old that its audience knows the narrative that the museum is setting out to illustrate. In this case, of course, it's that hypercritical narrative that seemed to evolve after the 1990s. Buffalo Bill up here is almost liberated from the material culture of his life and times, and his story is divorced from historical context. So it hasn't necessarily come full circle, but as this symposium and, um, and the many presenters prove, Buffalo Bill is present, and he is being taken seriously um, in his uh, influence in American culture and as for me, I'm being forced to close. <laughs> Steve, you're happy about that. Uh, my motto has become uh, the caption in a New Yorker cartoon from a couple of years ago where a man on his couch is telling his psychiatrist, but I like living in the past. It's where I grew up. <laughs> Thank you.